So our camera died right as we picked up our audio. So there will be no camera angle for this podcast, but hey, 1931 box office winner versus the Academy Awards Best Film winner. Let's get to it. All right, I'm going to be talking about another movie I watched when we talk about one of these. But we'll get there. All right. Welcome back, Grab Proof Film Review. Welcome back, champions. <laughs> Champion. So you're assuming oh, more sorry. than one watcher. Sorry, that, that was. <laughs> sorry, that was that was kind of a, a nice little homage to a, um, a cooking YouTube channel that I watched called Nat's What I Reckon. He's an Australian guy. Nat's What I Reckon. Yeah, his, his name's Nat. Hmm. Um, but yeah, he, he that's that's how he starts all of his stuff. It's just welcome, champions. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really cool. That's why, like, I, I've never heard of that one, but I watch another uh, Australian guy. Um, they just like like funny reviews of stuff but i'm spacing on his channel can't help you you got to be way more specific aussie man aussie man reviews okay yeah uh he'll like um oh, he does game reviews doesn't he uh well i mean he may have done some game reviews but mainly it's like uh videos that are like potentially going viral or something like oh, that or, right. or news stories or people just send him like clips of stuff that they recorded and everything and he talks over him and uh re- gives his thoughts on him or like if it's an animal video he's like acting as the animal like he just had a i mean this is by the time this comes out this would be in two months ago um but he had a short come out where like a kangaroo got into somebody's like uh camper mm-hmm. uh pull behind camper um and it was exploring and they're like get out get out and he's like and then you hear him going but something smells good in here <laughs> and he's like what's this your bedroom and he's like just i uh, i think he's fucking hilarious um, I've been following him for a while. So yeah, Ozzy Man reviews. And Nat, whatever he N- said. Nat Nat's what I reckon. It's, that's it's what a I fantastic reckon. like cooking cooking like YouTube thing. Like he'll do different um just different recipes and stuff like yeah. that. And one of the funnier bits that he did um early on was there was he was like, like gonna you know, like saute some onions or something like that. And he throws in like a, a huge ass like pat of butter and he's like, Normally if you're making this, you wouldn't use that much butter, but I did so I don't care. <laughs> it's 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 kind of funny. You have to send me that channel. I'll check it out. Yeah, it's it's good. Well, speaking of checking out, uh, well, it actually sounded like checking out. Like I'm done. I meant checking out is like check out. What we're gonna talk about. All right, peace. <laughs> speaking of checking out, yeah. later. Later. Catch you next credits. <laughs> <laughs> That's this week's episode. Yeah, and we're done. <laughs> Excellent. That was Go quick. watch these YouTube channels. Peace. That was quick. Um, <laughs> What, what do we, looks like we're continuing, we, 1931 is all day. It's all day, all day. Um, so this this is uh, another one of their variations of the all day IPA. This is their hazy version. Um, hazy IPAs is something that has taken the beer world by storm in the last seven-ish years. They should call it amnesia haze. Man, <laughs> man damn. Um, Sorry, that's a Europe story that we're not sharing here. Nope. Um, but no, it's, it's, a it's an unfiltered, um, variety of IPAs that are typically sweeter, um, than other styles. Um, they're just, like I said, they have, every brewery has at least two styles of hazy IPAs that they do. Mm-hmm. Um, personally, it's not one of my favorites. Specifically because of this? No, or it's, just, it's just, it's, this it's, style it's, it's the style is okay. everywhere. Um, okay. it's personally not one of my favorite styles just because of how sweet they typically are Mm -hmm. um but i thought this would be kind of fun since we're kind of sticking with the all-day train while we're on the the 1930s here (laughs) um kind of fun to to give it give it the old college try as it were fair enough yeah no i I thought it was funny like so uh, if it's not apparent by our clothes um we record (laughs) three episodes at a time uh because meeting you know once a week uh is just it's, it doesn't work. Try to do that. Um, no, yeah. I have like four copies of this shirt. Go, go, Chiefs! <laughs> <laughs> I had my uh, my uh, Chiefs uh, um, jeans? like pajama pants. Yeah, Chiefs jeans. <laughs> no, Chiefs j- pajama pants on earlier um, before I got ready. Um, <laughs> we should say uh, the second game of the NFL playoffs. The Chiefs is playing against uh, the uh, Bills. The Buffalo today. Bills. Um, so yeah, so, we're we're recording this on we're, that. That day, you can go back and find it. With any luck, the next episode is like, Chiefs won! <laughs> yeah, if you, if you come back on the next episode and we're super sad, you know why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So, anyway. 
So this is their, like I said, this is their haze version of the all day IPA. Mm-hmm. Um, this, I, 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 does haze refer to anything? It's just what they decided to call this style. It's, it's just the style. style. It's just yeah. hazy. Um, some of them look like straight fruit juice. Um, there's one particular example. Um, and some, a lot of them actually share the same characteristic where it looks like a glass of orange juice and mm. it tastes like a glass of orange juice. <laughs> So when I say they can be very sweet, I mean it. Fair enough. Um, and do, do all the all days have the red camper wagon just with different stuff on it? For the most part, yeah. So, please enjoy. No bubble up this time. Yeah, this one didn't explode. <laughs> Pro, sir. So <laughs> Oh, I'm be honest. This one doesn't taste any different to me than the one last really? one I did. Really, really, I'm surprised by that actually. Well, it's like the hops hit you, and then it goes away, and then done. Sweet. That's kind of how it's. I... It's very sweet to me. Because what was the other all day one we just did? For the so last we we did the general, uh, the standard all day IPA, um, and then we did their cold IPA. That's right. Yeah, I'm not tasting a difference between these two. But again, like I said, my, well, like I said in a previous podcast, um, my palate for beer is not like the same as yours in the sense that like, you'll be like, oh, I pick up a note of turmeric or something crazy. Tum- off. I know that's yeah. not in beer, but I try to pick something like crazy off the wall. And I'm like, how the fuck does he taste that? <laughs> it's it. So like this one, it's, it's, it's sweeter to me. Um, and with it being sometimes with with hazy ipas i don't know the specific recipe for this one but they'll put um like uh flaked oats or like something like that to give it like a creamier sort of texture um makes it a little bit thicker that kind of thing and it adds to the it adds to the sugar and some of the some of the more extreme examples will actually add straight milk sugar to it So then they'll add vanilla. So they'll call it like a vanilla milkshake IPA or something like that. And it tastes exactly nothing like you would think an IPA does because it, it, you're basically drinking a milkshake. Well, it could be that I'm a, a big sweets guy. Um, and so when you're like, taste sweet, I'm like, no, it doesn't. But <laughs> I don't eat a lot of sweets. So it's, I, I, it, it, is, it is on the sweeter side for me. I had three cookies with my dinner yesterday. And not little like baby slider cookies. Three cookies with my yeah. dinner yesterday. Nothing wrong, um, with, nothing wrong with some cookies here and there. Yeah, but my here and there is more like here, 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 here and there. Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> Happens a little more than it should. I gotcha. Gotcha. Um, but hey, let's get to talking about yeah, some let's, movies Yeah, let's get here. to the movies. If you did your homework, we are doing the Academy Awards winner for best film from 1931. Uh, versus the highest box office gross of 1931 uh, for this podcast, and that is Cimarron uh, and City Lights. Mm-hmm. So I figure we'll talk about the Academy Award winner first, which is Cimarron. Okay. Uh, directed by Wesley Ruggles, Ruggles, which is an interesting name. Uh, written by Howard Estabrook, which I think is also an interesting name. It was adapted. It was based off of a book. Was it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Based off um, a book by the same name. Oh, that's right. I did see that. I did see that. Um, production budget of one point four million, and a box office of one point three million. Uh, but these are the numbers that I find in the year. I'm sure as re-releases and everything like that, and DVD sales now they've made one point five million. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, and that's pushing. It. Um, so I'm going to get into the actors here, and I'm going to go back to front for a reason. And I'll say that reason in a second. So, starring uh, Nance O'Neill as Felis Venable, Irene Dunn as Sabra Cravat, Estelle Taylor as Dixie Lee, and Richard Dix as Yancey Cravat. I had to stop the very first thing shows on the screen, title and starring. I had to stop and pause it because I was laughing so hard. The dude's name is Dick Dix. Yeah. While that is such gutter humor, <laughs> I found that so fucking funny when I saw that. I was like, starring Dick Dix! <laughs> um, that I, w- I was just cracking up. So. I, I'm not going to lie, I, that did not cross my mind at all. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I just, I just I saw Dick Dix. Richard Dix. Um, 
Moving on. <laughs> it's about a, a newspaper editor that settles in an Oklahoma boom town with his reluctant wife at the end of the 19th century. So, an interesting fact about this film that I saw was that on the strength of the opening of the movie, the opening of the movie is essentially when uh, America stole land from Native Americans mm -hmm. and opened it up for people to just rush out there and the, the plant land their rushes. claim. Yeah, that yeah. stuff. Like I, um, I knew a little bit about it prior to this movie. Um, and it was probably one of the more accurate portrayals of how those things went down. Like it was, uh, here's your starting line on this Go. date at noon, they would fire a cannon and you're off looking for plots. Yeah. <laughs> um, because of that opening scene, uh, Cimarron is often labeled as a Western, mm -hmm. but what you'll find out as we go through this film, only like the first little portion of it is, could be considered a Western, like finding the land and then settling the land and then like the initial like rickety buildings they build. But this film uh, travels across, uh, I think it's like, God, something like 50 years or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, so by the time you get to the middle of it and the end of it, it it's not a Western anymore at all. Yeah. Um, but I just thought it was funny. It's often labeled as a Western because of that first little beginning. But this was, because of that, this is considered the first Western to win a Best Picture Oscar. But granted, we're only like three years into the Oscar, so okay. But it would be another 59 years mm -hmm. before another Western would win Best Picture. And that was Dances with Wolves, which yeah. I love that fucking movie. Yeah, Dances with Wolves, and then it was Unforgiven after that, which was a couple of years later. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, so I just, I thought that was an interesting little fact, because um, the, it's weird to consider this a Western, even though it starts that way, because the characters, it even says right here, characters age more than 40 years during the course of the story. That that was actually a selling point for the actress, um, <clears throat> the main the, the main actress of this movie, what she used to get uh, a screen test and, and inevitably, or eventually the job was she she was going to apply for that or go out for this role and she hired a makeup artist to mm -hmm. apply makeup to make her look uh, progressively older so that she could sell herself for this the same role over the time period which i thought was kind of interesting yeah no i, I remember reading that um <clears throat> yeah you got to do what you got to do to hey if, to, if that's to what you got to do to get a job right um so yeah uh getting into the movie mm -hmm. The, it opens with 200 million acres of Native American land that was opened, literally says opened for white settlement. Yeah. Um, which on the one hand, I was kind of like, so you steal their land and then give it away. That's kind of fucked up. But as I'm watching this, two little things. One, most people are on horseback or in uh, a wagon pulled by a horse, like racing to find their plot of land and put their stake in saying it's, it's theirs, right? But there's one guy in an old-timey bicycle that goes by with that yeah, giant big yeah, wheel and little that. back wheel just, like, trying to go over yeah. all this uneven terrain. I thought that was kind of funny. They So for that particular land rush, and that was in 1899? Something like that. Um, 50,000 people showed up um, for that particular rush. And it was so chaotic and completely just, you know, off, off, the, off the rails that something like 60 people died. Right. just rushing out trying to get plots of land either horse accidents or they fell off their thing and got run over mm -hmm. all kinds of just absolute chaos and pandemonium <laughs> i mean it makes sense um the opening since it's pretty much the exact same thing reminded me of have you ever seen the movie far and away that with yeah Tom Cruise and yeah same Man? type of situation yeah because yeah. that was the end of the movie was mm -hmm. them doing a land rush as soon as that happened i was like oh hey far and away yeah same same uh, kind of setup yeah so no i, I didn't know uh People had died on that, so that's mm -hmm. yeah, crazy. There was, there's quite a few. Um, so we we've, we've mentioned before captions. I literally have in on this list says DVD had captions because this is one I was having a hard time listening, and I actually checked, and I was like, yes, captions. So I was able to. I, I rented it on Prime, is where I got it. <laughs> I got it for free from the library. Oh, you fancy <laughs> using them social services? I, I, I'm not fancy. You're the one with money paying for things. I got it for free. <laughs> I wish I had money. <laughs> I didn't say a lot of money. You had you had enough to afford a rental. Dude, it was three dollars. <laughs> yes, that's still money. Even if it was two cents, that's money. Fine. Now, now I took sorry. advantage of our local services. That's fine. That's great. I'm very happy to hear that you were using the local library. 
But anyways, I was just happy to like to have captions and be able to understand what the hell they were saying. A lot of these older DVDs don't. No, they don't. That's why I was like, yeah, it's kind of... like, yeah. I, I literally freaked out when I saw that. I was like, I can actually know what they're saying. I, I, I know what's going on. Yeah. Um, so, the land rush. They're rushing out there. Um, Yancey is out there, you know, trying to get his land. He'd already found the plot that he wants, and he heads straight there. And Dixie follows him, uh, and she says, like, that sounds like the land I wanted to get when he's describing it. I don't know if that's actually true, if she just followed him, but she's chasing after him, uh, and they're the only two heading for this plot. And he's way ahead of her, and she, like, her horse falls and apparently hurts itself. It breaks its legs. And she's, like, now, like, obviously, she, like, makes some noise, and Yancey hears and comes, like, back with his horse, and she's like, oh, my God, my, my horse hurt itself. Can you can you kill it for me? And so he gets down trying to help and take care of the horse. She steals his fucking horse mm-hmm. and goes and steals the fucking land that he was about to get. Yeah. And my first uh, thought being the time period, and I was like, why don't you fucking kill her? <laughs> like, who would know? Nobody's there. Because that's in the time period where everyone's just like, bang, 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 killing everybody, and they didn't care. Not everybody was like that. Um, well, in movies, everybody was well, like that. Let me let me preface. Well, I mean, still, like, there was still... Hostess. I mean, we're also keeping this in the context of this particular movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, nowadays, if somebody... No, don't go around shooting. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's like, they, they portrayed him as, like, a real stand-up kind of guy, kind of thing, aside from some other stuff that we'll get into later. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah and we find that out, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, it's like, she took total advantage of the situation, just, like, stole his horse and just left him in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um. And uh, they. How did he get back to, like, because in the very next scene, like they were, they were there was a, they were at dinner, with the yeah. family, and he's like way far away, like uh, not even in the same area anymore, because no, this was like in pre-state Oklahoma. Yeah, it was in the middle of where the state. They went was. back to wherever they were state in Wichita, they lived in. Wichita. Kansas. Yeah, that's right, Wichita, Kansas. Yeah, in the Kansas, uh, um, which is you know, th- two hundred miles away, three hundred miles away. Something. I don't know. And they just like magically like yeah she stole my horse and then like his mom was yelling at him like how dare you let that woman steal what you were going yeah. for yeah and i think somebody even said like why didn't you just kill her <laughs> uh, or, or he said like i would have killed her uh but you know she's not a man yeah and i'm like okay so it was a that's sexist if it was a man you'd kill her <laughs> yeah. but since she's a woman you're like no i can't treat you like a man yeah <laughs> the, the one time sexism works in somebody's favor <laughs> No, it was, it was a weird situation, but yeah, they, they have that whole argument, like, and he's like, well, I'm, I'm just going to go down anyway and look for, I, I guess he was going, he, he was just going. Yeah, because it was like, it's like, it's a brand new town, they're going to build a town, we're going to, you know, live the Wild West and see this town become, you know, what it's going to be, and, you know, my wife's coming with me, and, you know, yeah. the wife's family, and even her, to some point, were, like, totally against it. But uh, she was more like reluctant than against it. And then she's like, no, I'm supporting my husband. We're going. We're going to go do this. And so they moved to. Uh, it's called Osage. Yeah, Osage. Because it wasn't Oklahoma yet. Uh, and essentially they're going to, you know, set up their lives there in this new town. And it shows them in a stagecoach in the middle of the country, you know, working their way towards this town. And it did make me wonder. I'm like kind of wonder what it'll be like to have to be going across country in a stagecoach so there's not like shock so it's kind of really Mm -hmm. you know um in the dead of night no electricity just imagine the stars you could see oh man i bet that would look really pretty until you get lost (laughs) well (laughs) well, we even though there's no electricity we still have gps Um, (laughs) it's called a compass god but no i mean seriously like we will never be able to know what the sky looks like because of all the like ambient light there there are places that you can go to you you can get close but there's still even on the edges there's still going to be some ambient light because of there's just so much flooding the sky i think there's like two places in the country or not the country in the world that are the most sought after to go do like astrology research because it has the least light pollution. There's uh, there's there's, like there's a, place a couple of places Africa or something like that. Well, there's there's a couple places. One in the ones in the U.S. You can go to the Badlands in South Dakota. Yeah, but it's still not great. It's it's not it's not a I mean it's not like pristine. It, it's it's the best you can find in the, the, in the United States. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and there are some places close to town where you can get a pretty good view that's that has that minimizes light pollution. Yeah, it's still going to be there. But I mean, it's you can still see a lot more than you would then say from your backyard. Yeah, no, definitely. Because you look up from your backyard and it's like you don't even see the stars. Um, but you get away from that light pollution and start seeing more and more and more. But I'm just, I would love to see what the sky looks like with no light pollution. There should be like a holiday that for like 60 seconds or maybe even just 10 seconds, we, we, we turn off all electricity. So you get 10 seconds of like, that's what it looks like. And then turn electricity back off. That would be mass pandemonium. <laughs> not, not if everyone knew. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just like the um those movies where like you know for the next few hours all crime is legal <laughs> oh the purge yeah you want to turn this into the purge just without electricity for 10 seconds that's it <laughs> not actually purging but 10 seconds of no electricity you everyone that, that needs electricity a put it on a put, <laughs> put it on, on a, a battery or something um anyways i know that, I know that couldn't happen uh <laughs> so uh they're they move into this town, and uh, Yancey's like in a, a bar about to get a drink. And I thought this was really weird because I had never knew this. Like, I know old timey registers like have the little numbers that pop up, have the little like flag thing that's how much it is. He pulls balls out of a glass and puts them in the register to make the numbers pop up to know how much it is before putting the money in there. Hmm. I didn't pay any attention to that, to be honest. Yeah, I just saw like it just showed a shot close of glasses, and he's pulling these like little wooden balls out of it, and then it shows him going like this up the top of the register, putting the balls in certain holes, and then it goes ching and pounces up the like dollar or whatever or whatever huh. it was. Yeah, I, I I didn't really pay much attention to that at all. I was more taken aback during that during that particular scene about how the main character seemingly knew everyone. Yeah, yeah, he just walks in and uh, just Eight like, people, hey, like, hey, it's hey, Yancy. Yeah. yeah. Eight people. <laughs> Apparently, he really got to know everyone before they the the cannon went off and they did the land rush. It, it, well, it, I mean, they were friends of his, I'm assuming. But, I mean, like when he got into this brand new town, even people that they had not introduced, it was like, oh, I know that dude. And mm -hmm. throughout the whole movie, they were like, yeah, I heard he was up in, you know, Amarillo doing something. He yeah. was over here. Like, he's this legendary figure. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's, he's Dwayne Johnson or Tom Cruise or something where <laughs> everybody knows where he is at all times. Yeah. Or not maybe where he is, but about him. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry. But yeah, no, like, you're absolutely right. Like, they're going through and everyone knows him and everything like that. And at one point, he meets the local gang. Like, what was that, what's that dude's name? Giannis? Was that his I, name? I admit, I, maybe. Lou, I, Lou Giannis or something like something that? Something like that. I didn't write down the guy's name, so I missed that part. But essentially, at one point, like, the guy's, like, thinking he's being funny and shoots at Yancey. And puts a bolt through his hat, and it's just oh, supposed his, to be like his, a his shot pristine, across the bow. Yeah, his pristine white cowboy yeah, his white hat. white cowboy hat. And, like, he takes it off, and he goes, and he's, like, talking to the guy. And then he, he's like, you know what? We're going to... He just does his, like, shriek. Oh, the, yeah, and the, the dude walks up with explanation. He's like, he's like yeah. that's a Cherokee death howl. That means yeah. you or him. Like, yeah. thanks, bud. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, also, I'm like, one, why would he be doing that if he's not Cherokee? And two, that was out of fucking nowhere. Uh, it, it took me by surprise because I'm like, what is he doing? Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, there was the, you know, the exposition dump at the end there with, with what's his name? It's Cherokee death cry. Oh, it's a death cry. <laughs> like, thanks, Chief. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, just, that was strange. But then he, 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 like, walks away, puts his hat back on, and then you get, when your hat goes on, you see where the bullet is. I'm like, dude, that would have gone through the side of your fucking skull. It wasn't, yeah. like, way up here in the hat. It was way down here by the band. Yeah. And, and right before that, like, he, it, right after, what's his name, um, Giannis, like, fires through his hat. Yeah, he shoots like, him and, like, clips he, the edge he, of his like, ear. He clips his ear, and he's like, that's that's the Giannis brand right there. He'll always remember that. Yeah. Like, okay, that's cool, I guess. And I'm just like, you guys are using, like, old-timey pistols. They were not that fucking accurate. Especially hip shooting like <laughs> Yeah, that. I know, they're all like, <laughs> Oh, Any, God. You might as well just, like, hold it up sideways, because you're, you're like, liable to get a more accurate shot. Right. Well, then, like you know, he said they set up their house and everything. He's gonna live there and start a start a paper. Yeah, he's gonna start up a newspaper, be the newspaper man. Uh, and apparently, he's also while his investigations are making him a bit of a vigilante because he's trying to run the riffraff out. And then they're like, "We should start a church." And they decide to have him give the first sermon, and because they don't have a priest yet, so yep. I'm like he's the newspaper man, vigilante, and he's the priest. And the... he's the priest who gives a sermon about how he's gonna expose this criminal. And then he does it, 
and then the, the dude, criminal shoots at him in the middle of the, and he just, then he shoots him back yeah. and kills him which happens to be the same guy that he had a run with run in with earlier mm -hmm. what a quinky dick who is apparently the guy who killed the previous newspaper editor before he showed up yeah he was trying to solve that crime yeah so i'm just like okay uh, but after the kill i thought this was kind of interesting he's back uh like in his house and he takes his pistol out and he gets this little like file and he starts filing a notch in the back of the hilt of his gun mm -hmm. and there's like five or six more and i'm like oh apparently he tracks his kills yeah he's, he's a serial killer yeah so um but yeah uh <laughs> moving on <laughs> about how the hero of our story has killed six or five people All right um and i actually skipped over this i meant to say it so on the way to osage uh they get attacked uh, by some like oh, yeah. bandits, and, and, he... and all of a sudden he's like, "What are you doing, kid?" And the the guy pulls down. He's like, "He's like Yancey." So he like knows the bad guys. Yeah, and he's like, "Oh, okay, like you know, we're not gonna rob you." And Yancey tells him, like, "Well, stay out of town because that's where we're gonna be." And he's like, "Oh yeah, no problem." Well, the second day in town, <laughs> the kid and his gang show up to rob a bank. Yeah, they started having a shootout at the bank, and Yancey like kills all of them. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he's the, the he's vigilante, a, gudslinger, lawman, apparently, too. Um, he was also doing, like, law law stuff. Like, when they showed up, like, he had a little tent there. Or, um, like, he was doing papers and stuff. Was he? I missed that part. <laughs> but, like, they, they had like they had the newspapers and stuff like that. And he was also, like... Um, well, actually, they, they showed another dude that had, like, this lane, land claim thing that two guys were going after. But um, he also had some other law stuff i mean the dude was basically like the superman every guy doing every job in this town <laughs> that's why everybody knew him because he did all the work for the whole town no kidding it no was matter what they needed he was there yeah it was ridiculous anyway he, he sees you while you're sleeping and knows when you're awake oh so he's santa too <laughs> <laughs> um but so like oh, something is referenced earlier in the film saying that like you know he's kind of a, a wanderer in the sense that like he can't sit around anywhere yeah so Supposedly he's moving from Wichita because he's like, I can't spend another day in Wichita. I've been here too long. And they'd been there for like a year or so. And then he moves to Osage and... No, it was five he's... years. It was five years. Was he it... mentioned that was the longest he stayed in one place. It was five years. Was that in the Wichita? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but they moved to um, the Osage stuff and like they run into that Dixie Lee chick uh, and everyone hates her and there's all these women around her. So I'm assuming she's like a brothel owner or something because of all the ladies, but they never actually say that. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm like, why are all the women just following her around? I don't know. But he essentially, he can't stay in place, one place for very long. And he's, like, getting fed up after the several years they've been in Osage. And he hears 400 million more acres are yeah, being opened up. Yeah, another land up. rush. Yeah. And he's like, let's go do that. And his wife's like, no, we live here. We have a newspaper here. Like we We've built here. a lot here. Yeah. And then he just like, well... I'm going to go check it out anyway. And he just fucks off. He ups and leaves for five years. Yeah. With he, no word, no letters, yeah. no nothing. Never writes her, never tells anyone where he's at. We don't even know if he even got the land. He just shows up five years later and he's wearing a military uniform. It, that was one thing they didn't really like. Because, I mean, he just disappears for five years, right? No mm -hmm. no word back because he, he had a son that he named Sim. He had a brand new baby daughter. And then just Donna disappears for five years with no word back home. Shows back up. Come to find out he had participated in the land rush. He fought in the Spanish-American War for the U.S. Army. And then shows back up like nothing's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, also, so right before he shows up, uh, Sabra's at the table with her kids and praying for her husband's like safe return. And I'm like, it's been five years. Would you still be praying for him every fucking day? Or would you be like, to hell with him, man. He, I he's mean, gone. maybe. I mean, I, I could or see. Is it, or is it specifically the, the film code of, like, the faithful wife? I bet that's probably it. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, some people, especially if they... It's, it's, it's a weird thing. Like, if someone goes missing, then yes, they're going to do that. But if they just willingly up and leave... Yeah. Then I, I would no have to say contact. realistically not. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, so. I, I was I, I was actually pretty surprised. Like he just shows back up and like everything's hunky dory, and he's like, "Wow, look at my daughter! You're so big now. Where have you been for the last five yeah. years, dude?" He's like, "And son, how are you?" And since he was saying that, I literally thought, "I'm like, you don't know their fucking names, do you?" <laughs> 
you took off five years ago. Your your daughter was like a baby, and you come back saying son, daughter, and then turn to your wife and say Sabra. Like, yeah. So do you not know your kids' names? Yeah. Well, this whole time she was running the newspaper mm-hmm. in his absence, mm-hmm. and was doing a pretty damn good job of it. Yep. Growing growing the business with Adam. <laughs> it's just. Like, I mean, I like they were portraying this dude as like the everyman superhero kind of thing. And then he just screws off for five years. Yeah. And then, like I said, comes back and hey, everything's great. Yeah. It did not sit well with me. No, <laughs> I, 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 I totally agree. Um, and the fact that he, so the whole time, like he's been gone, the, the paper is still like portraying that he's the editor and yeah, he's got his, name on like, his name's still on it and it never got changed. Um, but he comes back and he's like, like, I'm going to pick up where I left off. Uh, here, like they introduce Ruby, which is, she's like working in their house. She's like a young woman and, um, around the same age as her son and like, is like setting the table for dinner and everything like that. Uh, and she's apparently while a worker in the cravat, cravat house is also a daughter of the, the chief of the local tribe. Yeah, her, her tribe. name was, was Ruby Big Elk. I didn't catch the last name, so mm-hmm. that's good. Um, so I was like, oh, that's strange. Cause like at first I was like, why did they just randomly throw this like new person in here? What's going on? But, um, we carry her forward later. Uh, <clears throat> so while we just got introduced to Ruby, we find out that Dixie Lee's still around too, which is the one that stole the land during the land rush from Dick Dix. Um, <laughs> from Dick Dix. <laughs> <laughs> it's a proper uh, name for this character I, when I'm, I'm 12 and this is funny <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, she's on trial and for uh, something they yeah they never say what it, she's on she trial was causing for. a nuisance or something but they didn't get specific yeah and Yancey's like uh, his wife says no one's going to defend her she's going to go to prison and Yancey's like I'll defend her yeah you've been gone for five years you walk into town and like I'm going to be your defense lawyer Mm-hmm. You know nothing about what she's been doing for the last five years. You don't know. You don't know Jack, dude. That was a good game back in the uh, it, 2000s. It's still pretty good. It's still pretty fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, to, to bar, borrow the phrase, he, he has no idea what's going on. But he's just like, I'm going to defend her. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, and so and his wife gets mad at that because his wife doesn't like her, and she asked the same question that I had in my head. She says, "What is she to you?" Yeah, because we've not had other than her stealing the land from him. We've not really seen any other interaction with them other than like, oh, hey, welcome to the city when they first moved there. Yeah. That's pretty much it. And so they're having the trial and trying to put her to to jail and everything like that. And I want to cover a couple quick things with that. The prosecutor says Dixie strikes at the very heart of decency of the Southwest. And that stuck out to me because I'm like, obviously, a lot of states weren't part of the union because I was like, Southwest? Oklahoma's part of the Midwest. Yeah. Um, but I was like, oh, they probably hadn't had all the other states in there yet. So it makes more sense. But it just stuck out to me. But Yancey, in defending her, seems to know a lot about Dixie's past mm-hmm. that I'm curious how he would even know. He references apparently a married man knocked her up. And uh, I think she, like, if I'm not mistaken, I think she, like, lost the child. But everyone knew that she had had sex with a married man. And so everyone, like, brandished her as the bad person. And, the, like, the married man just disappeared. And she said, oh, I never saw him again. This allows her to win the trial and not go to jail because everyone feels sorry for her and how they've been judging her. But here's my thing. Yancey says later to his wife that, yes, he may have been pressing some buttons with them and and pushing the envelope, I guess, but everything on the story was true. And I'm like, hmm, while she says, and this is never brought up, but this is my theory, while Dixie says she never saw him again, was that the only lie in the story? Was Yancey the married man that got her pregnant right after the land rush and then left and she saw him again, but obviously they're, like, not together, and that's what her past... Because, like, how else would he know the fucking past I of have her no clue. Story? There was a lot left out of this particular film. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, maybe some of it was explained in the book that didn't make the movie. Um, but that's a sound theory. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, so, I, yeah, I don't they, see any other reason <clears throat> why. 
that would be that way. They present this dude as Superman, and now everything's starting to look a little shady. A little bit, a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so she's free to go. And if I'm not mistaken, we don't actually even hear from Dixie ever again nope. after she's free to go. Yeah, she's, she's just up and disappears out of the movie. Yeah. Uh, but so Yancey returns to working the newspaper. And during that time, oil is discovered on the Native American land on the reservation. And a bunch of the white guys are like, we could manage it better. Essentially, want to go steal from them again. There was there was a big motion picture that just came out about that. Really, it's called Killers of the Flower Moon. Is that what that is? That is exactly what that's about. The when they find uh, oil on the Osage lands. Hmm. I may have to watch that now. I wasn't planning on watching that yeah, but based on the trailers. Yeah, it's it's about that particular that 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 whole thing. Um, I will say I I haven't seen it yet. I would really like to. I'm a big Martin Scorsese fan. Um, it is a major time investment. It is a three and a half hour movie. <laughs> That's why you watch it in three chunks. <laughs> an hour here, an hour there, and an hour and a half there. <laughs> but it's it's winning a lot of awards, and yeah. or and will likely be up for. Um, well, if it wins best uh, film, we'll be watching it anyway in about eight years when we catch up to the. Or 2020s. I'll just watch it next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um, but uh, I guess Yancey's also running for governor during this time. And yeah, the white they, they guy's like, oh, reference, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll back you for governor. Make sure you win if you, you know, help us go and, you know, you handle the oil for the the people who don't know what they're doing kind yeah. of thing. And I'm like, well, Yancey's 100% against that and even wants to write a story in the paper about it. That that was one thing that, I, that actually kind of, caught my attention for this particular movie was aside from the fact that this this um, Yancey guy was initially presented as this superhero and things started looking a little shady some of the messages and things that he that was portrayed in this film were incredibly progressive mm -hmm. for that time frame and, and he even mentions it like I want to publish an editorial that the um, Indians should be given full citizenship the yep. right to vote all of this stuff and I'm like in 1930, wow, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. I thought that was actually a pretty positive point. No, yeah, I totally agree. Like, I I noted the same things in the sense that, like, they, they can't, I felt like they couldn't make up their mind with Yancey. He's, like, very forward-thinking on things like that, but then very backwards-thinking on things like relations with his, how he treats his wife and family. Yeah. So, it's kind of like, He's he's clearly not perfect. No, and, and I get uh, yeah. nobody's perfect, and you can't portray like a. But they, they there was a a period, you know, a tale of two things going on here at the same time, and they didn't really mesh very well. Mm -hmm. That's that's what caught my attention because like he's a super guy, he's a shit family man. Yeah. <laughs> but then he has these super you know great progressive ideas for how he wants to do things on the governorship. So it, none of this like it. it couldn't really gel very well to me. No, I, I totally agree. And like my thought was, I feel like they were trying to look, have like an underlying message with this film in the sense that, so, you know, the kids are kind of grown up ish now, uh, since he's been back for a few years and Yancey's all about fighting for what's right for, you know, Dixie Lee who had no one to defend her. And you know, the, 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 the Osage, nation and what's being done to them uh and kind of fighting for quote unquote the little guy uh and his wife has been kind of fighting against him on that to a certain degree in the sense of not believing in dixie lee why are you you know trying to do all this stuff with the native americans her son is is planning to marry ruby mm -hmm. that we talked about earlier and the wife is against that and her daughter is also growing up to be quite the not nice person uh in the way that she acts and treats uh people who are like not like her mm -hmm. um so it's like it's portraying the male figures as upstanding progressive and great for you know the city and the nation and it's portraying the female figures as excuse my language but stuck up bitches mm. so i'm just kind of like is that like a message the director and writer is trying to get across that men are better 
Because that's what I'm getting from this, and that's not a good message to be trying to put Yeah, I, I don't know if that's what they were intending to do, but that is what came across. Um, I don't know. It, it's, it, it was very... Um, yeah, they like you said, they were trying to portray everything as um, on the the women's side is like you said like she, she made several comments about how like they were dirty and you know mm. we don't want to interact with them don't take anything from them don't talk to them that type of you know that type of yeah. trash um and then at the end like he ends up marrying ruby and then they end up having or um we're okay so yeah we were let's see he was running for governor um there's, it's going to be a minute till he actually marries Ruby. Yeah, so it, it's it's got a little bit, but he they they kind of hint at it like he walks in like oh hi Ruby you know that type <laughs> of stuff and he's a fourteen ish year old something I don't know, um because the the actors portraying these people are much older than what they yeah are no kidding be, and all so. they did like they throw a mustache on him and now he's yeah. older <laughs> yeah, um but I mean to that end that's why uh, Sabra was like fighting against like the story that Yancey wanted to publish too yeah. Uh, about you know america's screwing over the native americans uh and he's like you see what's on this paper at the top of this page it has my name listed as the editor and as long as my name's there my way goes cut to 22 years later after so after <laughs> after it, there was a title card that pops up and says he gave into his wanderlust and disappeared yep 22 years he just up and like they talked about it like he never never oh he doesn't write letters i'm pretty yeah. sure he's alive <laughs> yeah yeah they're just like nobody knows where the hell he is 22 years have let have passed sabra is running the paper the rickety town they had lived in for the first few years is now like a full-fledged city with mm -hmm. cars driving down streets and it shows her like putting final touches on the paper everyone's like old now that was working on the paper and his name is showing still there as the editor and at this point i'm like fuck yancey like why the hell would you keep his name on there like i don't care how much of a loving person you are i was hard pressed at five years gone with no word for you to still have his name now, on. Now over plus. two decades yeah fuck that shit put your own name at the top <laughs> i don't know what the rules were for being declared dead in absentia back in those days. But I have to imagine it. I mean, after 20 years with no word, we can declare him dead. And now all of this stuff is mine. Something. I don't know. It's it just it, <clears throat> like that. Like, okay. Like five years. Wow. That was kind of a, that was kind of a bad move to pull there, bud. And then 20 plus. Yeah. And the, the funny thing is the 22 years, we're still not done. Because then, after it shows in the full-fledged city, and, you know, he's still listed at the top, and she's like, <sighs> then he goes, two years later. Yeah. <laughs> so we're in that when we're in that one section of years for like a minute and a half, and so now it's been 24 years with him gone and no word, and apparently Sabra is now a member of Congress. Yeah, she ran for Congress and won. And again, this, so this is one of those weird dichotomy things, right? Um, they're... This particular scene, or this movie was released in 1931, right? And the, the set piece was 1929-ish, if I remember right? I think so, yeah. Um, so part of that progressive thing was that women had just gotten the right to vote like 10 years before this movie was released. And there were like one woman congressman that I'm aware of was from Minnesota that was elected in in 18... 1890 something 1880 something um, don't look at me for expecting to no I, like i couldn't i couldn't remember the year <laughs> um but no like these again in a motion nationally distributed motion picture like women had just gotten suffrage and now all of a sudden there's they're portraying this woman as being elected as a congresswoman which is something that was very very rare mm -hmm. again very progressive type of situation but uh, it, it kind of clashes with all the other stuff. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, it's putting things in there that, to your point, like are progressive, how they're, how Yancey's wanting to write stories and defend, you know, the Native Americans and what they're doing with that. And then, of course, her being in Congress and all that stuff. Very true. But then it's also, like, put in there with a lot of sexist and racist yes. type connotations as well. Correct. So it's kind of like, what, what's your story here? What are you trying to get across? Because yeah. it's, it's, it's a mix of uh, emotion here. Um. So there's a, I guess, a, a banquet celebration kind of thing. For her being elected, for yeah. For her being elected. 
And so we've not talked about Felice, and I only put her on there for this reason. So Felice has been a woman that uh, Sabra is like uh, befriended when she first moved to this area that is now uh, becoming Oklahoma, uh, and has been like friends with her during this whole time. Had like little book clubs and all that kind of stuff with her. Um, but I put on there because there is a, like, it's roped off when people are coming and they have to present like their, um, invitation, invitation yeah. before the guy will move the rope and let him go through. And she steps up and asks for her invitation and she goes, I'm on the committee and grabs the rope, throws it aside and just starts walking Walk, in. By, yeah. The way the guy just stared at her and turned his head as she's walking by I just imagine he would all of a sudden would just run and just fucking spear tackle her and just like, no ticket! <laughs> <laughs> Throws her out. That obviously didn't happen, but just the, like the, his eyes were like, you bitch. <laughs> I was just like, okay. I, I can't imagine that as, uh, that they would just let someone waltz in that wasn't officially invited. Like if they're asking for tickets and stuff, if they don't know who you are, you're not getting in. Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of a funny thing where she's just like, ah, whatever, I'm on the committee. And then, like you said, he just stares her down. Mm-hmm. And then she just kind of waltzes in, like, whatever. <laughs> there was that There was that funny joke. Um, she walked up and was talking to that older gentleman. And she mentioned something about, like, her, um, like, ancestors was on the, uh, was part of the signers of the Declaration of Independence or something yeah. like that. And he's like, oh, that's neat. You know, one of my ancestors parted the Red Sea. <laughs> like, oh, that's kind of funny. <laughs> I didn't catch that because when I when they said that, I don't remember the name, but I literally was like, is that person actually on the declaration? Yeah, no. I was like, oh, it was. Um, but yeah, I didn't hear the Red Sea part. That's funny. I, I thought that was kind of funny. I was too busy looking up stuff while watching the movie. Oh. <laughs> it was related to the movie, though. <laughs> um, that's fine. I'm guilty of it. But that. so, uh, Sabra is then like giving like a speech and everything, and she's introducing her daughter uh it's like now and says what her last name is because apparently her daughter's gotten married and then it shows the person her daughter is sitting next to who who was easily three times the age of uh donna and they were like all holding hands and everything like that and i'm like wow dude there's robin the cradle and then there's fucking wow she made um early on when um sim said he was going to marry um Ruby. Ruby. She made a she made a comment and stuck with it that she was gonna find the richest person in town and marry him. And that's what she did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, that's exactly what she did. But it's it, it's one it's one thing to say that and then to see to like, actually show yeah. it. <laughs> uh, but I mean hey, I would say you love who you love, but that was not love. No. Um anyway, but yes, Cimarron marries Ruby, which this bothers me that the movie is called Cimarron, uh, but it has nothing to do with the character of Cimarron. No. It's, it's, they, they explained it in the movie. It was like the Spanish word for wild or wild, something like that. Maybe that's when and then it's referring to him because he's all over the fucking place. But um, So the, the dinner ends, and then she's uh, out exploring the new like oil fields and everything uh, that I assume is on the Native American land because of all the oil that was there. And there is an explosion... And a guy runs over and he's like uh, saying into the, the phone, like, hey, we need an ambulance or whatever. And I can't remember if it was her or one of the people in her party, but asked, like, what's going on? And they said, oh, like, something happened with a nitroglycerin and some old man, like, grabbed the nitroglycerin and held it to his chest uh, to save all of us. And it caved in his chest. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, who was it? He's like, oh, some old guy that hangs around. They says his name is Yance. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're like, <gasps> yeah, oh, it's him. Yeah. And so Sabra rushes over there. They find uh, Yancey on the ground, and I'm like, for a guy that just took nitroglycerin to the chest, I don't see He's any damage at right. all. <laughs> um, and then he dies in her arms, mm-hmm. uh, apparently having been gone for 24 years, but came back and was just hanging around oil fields and never told his fucking wife where he was. It just up, yeah, it up and disappeared, and then, like, he dies. And then they do, like, the big reveal of the, you know, stat. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I want to make one comment for you, that. Go ahead. Right before, like, literally the, earlier that day, uh, when they're going to have the, the, the dinner thing, and everything, they're going to be revealing a statue that yep. they're building uh, about the founding of the city and everything like that. 
Yeah, so, but yeah, it, it turns out. I mean, they so they, um, they they do the big statue reveal at the end, and it's it's obviously a likeness of of Yancey. Yeah, and then the movie ends. So 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 the day they were planning to reveal this statue uh, of Yancey, he just randomly comes back into her life dead. and dies. <laughs> Credits. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't um, overall. I mean, aside the some of the ideas I thought were. Were, were pretty cool, especially for the time frame. Overall, not a big fan of the movie. Um, and in my, that opinion is generally shared. It's, from what I've seen when I was doing some homework on it, it's generally regarded as the worst movie ever to win Best Picture. I don't know if I'd call it the worst, but it's not one of the greatest of ones we've seen so far. No, it wasn't, wasn't um, one of my favorites. There were aspects of it I liked, and there were other aspects I didn't like. Yeah. Um, so because of that, like, it, it, if you take out the Yancey disappearing and being gone for, what, at that point, 30 years of the life of this movie, uh, I'm like, if he stuck around and it was actually part of the family, maybe it wouldn't be as bad. But I'm like, what was the point? Also, just, uh, I don't know. My, my big issue with the movie was it was boring. Yeah, it was very boring, very drawn out. Um, the lead actor Dick Dix played everything with like this boisterous, you know, want to pound my chest mm-hmm. type of cadence in his voice, and it was just a boring movie. Yeah, I, I mean, like I had to, I was struggling to pay attention to the story at several parts throughout it. Yeah, I think what helped me is the fact that I, a number of these movies that we're having to watch, I structure in the sense of like, I watch late in the evening, and I purposely break it up. If it's a two-hour movie, I'm going to watch an hour tonight, and then an hour tomorrow. Uh, It helps me stay engaged a little more, because you're watching a two-hour movie that's super boring, you're just like, uh, oh, I'm not paying attention. Yeah, you start (laughs) playing around with other stuff. Uh No, it it just wasn't one of my favorites. Yeah, no, I I didn't love it either. Um, But hey... Let's jump over to the box office winner. Oh. City Lights. Uh, directed, written by, and starring Charlie Chaplin mm-hmm. as a tramp. Uh, by, by tramp, they mean vagrant. Yes. Curious if that's being picked up on audio. I can hear it. Well, I know. I, I can hear it, but I wasn't sure if I was hearing it or hearing it. I, I heard it. Did you? Okay. Yeah. My daughter stomping around downstairs. Um Stars, uh, yeah, Charlie Chaplin as Tramp, uh, Virginia Cheryl as a blind girl, Harry Myers as an eccentric millionaire, and Alan Garcia as the millionaire's butler. Mm-hmm. They, they don't actually give character names. It's just that's that's what their description is. That's what mm-hmm. you're getting. Yep. Uh, and it's with the aid of a wealthy erratic tippler, drunkard. Uh, drunkard. Okay. Uh, a dewy-eyed tramp who has fallen in love with a sightless flower girl accumulates money to be able to help her medically. So with this being a Charlie Chaplin flick about uh, his character, Tramp, a tramp, um, it is back to silent films again. Mm-hmm. When no he dialogue. started making this, silent films were starting to become obsolete. Mm-hmm. Um, and he elected to continue because, I mean, they'd already done a lot of work on it. So he just, let's just keep going and finishing it. Yeah, well, I mean, they did technically have some sort of talky at the beginning um that so... was pre- <laughs> go ahead i'm sorry so so the movie starts and i thought it was like kind of interesting the the title city lights appears like in little lights mm-hmm. over uh like in kind of like double exposure or whatever whatever over uh a view of the the city street of cars driving around but it wasn't it was done very well in the sense like it didn't look like there were two strips playing over the top of each other where you could see. Yeah, it was, was kind of neat. It yeah. looked really cool. And I was like, oh, that was done very well for when it was done. Um, but then <laughs> there's a, a statue reveal happening uh, and people are talking, but they're like talking through a kazoo and it's going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was it was kind of funny uh, with with that. Um, and there's there's a gag that will. We can, we can yeah. bring it up here in a second. Well, supposedly that was actually Charlie Chaplin talking. Oh, was it really? So uh, apparently that is the first on-film recording of his voice. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I mean that's just what I read online. Is that apparently that was Charlie Chaplin doing all the stuff for that. 
But I was just, at first I was like, what the fuck is this for? <laughs> because then like the boy <laughs> stuff goes away. Um, and then unveil the statue and the tramp is under it. Like he's sleeping, sleeping up and yeah, on the lap of the top statue. Yeah. And then when they, I thought this was funny when they're yelling at him to get down and everything like, and he's trying to back up. There's like a character holding up a sword and like the sword goes up yeah, his he pants. Did... He gets stuck and he's hanging from it, like yeah. squirming and everything. I, uh, I, what I thought was the best part of that whole skit was aside from him just just trying to get down and stuff like that was like they kept yelling at him and yelling at him get down get down get down and they you know they're kind of kind of screaming over and over again and then the band starts playing the star spangled banner so they all stop yelling and give the salute and stuff (laughs) and like i thought that was pretty funny actually yeah no it wasn't bad um yeah with this being a silent film though like at first i had this thought i'm like well how are they doing this because if all the theaters have been converted to talkies there's no like piano or band there to play the music anymore and they come to find out like the it's not a talkie but the the audio was still included because it was part like the music was actually put into the film Mm -hmm. so instead of dialogue it had all the music as part of when they played it so i thought that was oh okay it's it's not a talkie but it still came with its own audio yeah it it doesn't yeah it doesn't really qualify but it's close enough yeah so there's to be honest there's not a lot to the story here um but there is enough that we can talk about the fact that, so he meets like this um, blind girl selling flowers on the street, and he, um, I can't remember if he actually pays for one or not, but like she gives him a flower. I can't remember if I saw that he paid for it or not though. He did. Did he? Okay. Um, so he bought a flower from her, and then like some guy walks by, gets in a car, shuts the door, and drives away, and she looks off thinking like that was him, and he left. And he's just sitting there, like, looking back and forth between the car and her. And then just kind of, like, goes around the corner and sits quietly, and just, like, yeah. watching and everything. Um, come to find out, uh, apparently, this scene, I guess, if what I found was correct, was potentially shot a number of times. Because the point of it was for the blind flower girl to mistake him for a man with money. Right. And they he Charlie couldn't figure out how to portray that i guess until like they realized oh have him get in a car and drive away um i didn't pick that up while watching it that that was was supposed to be that's what that was supposed to be but i I read that later Mm -hmm. i i I thought it came across fine as far as like what they were well i picked up that she like she thought he left but not that she thought he had money because he left like that didn't occur to me that's Mm -hmm. the part that yeah gotcha um so he has his flower and he goes and is down by like the the, the riverfront yeah. and some drunk guy comes down with a rock and a rope and is in the middle of like tying himself around the neck of the rope uh rock and apparently gonna kill himself and well his, his wife had left him so yeah he, he was he was well, we don't we don't know that right then no but he yeah he was, he was gonna char- arm himself. Uh, yeah. or so should say tramp uh the the vagrant uh like has this little fun funny little like back and forth with him to save his life and uh, then yeah we find out that he's drinking mm. and doing all this stuff because his wife had left him uh, so he he saves the millionaire from suicide, and the millionaire befriends him because he's like, "Okay, cool, you you helped me. And you're, you're my you're my new best friend." Yeah, and he, he takes him out to this like nightclub, and I don't know if you saw this, but people were out dancing, and there was a a male dancer that comes by dancing in front of them, with his hands around the woman's throat, and looks to be like shaking her and fighting her as the, they're yeah, dancing. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Was that supposed to be like a performance piece? I don't know. Because he got involved with it, and now all of a sudden everybody's mad at him. Yeah. So, like, I don't know if it was this, like, were they just dancing? Was this an actual, like, assault? What the hell happened here? No idea. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I was just like, I, I need to make a reference to that. But, so, he just, he starts spending all this time hanging out with the, the millionaire. Uh, and he's still going back and, like, talking to the girl with the, the flowers and everything. Uh, and helping, essentially, he showed up one day and bought all her flowers, and it was money that he borrowed from the millionaire. Mm-hmm. Bought all her flowers, and the, he had the millionaire's car because the millionaire had driven home with him, and he was like, "Oh, I like your car." And the millionaire's like, "Well, keep it. Yeah, you know, it's yours." Like, Take it. <laughs> um, so he takes it and drives that girl home, and apparently, all it takes is you know some money and a car ride to make a girl fall in love, because <laughs> uh, that's what happens. She's like totally in head over heels in love with him, right? So I just thought that was kind of like, huh, wouldn't that love's be, changed a bit. Wouldn't that be fraud by deception? 
Well, I don't take it as he's ever purposely trying to do that. He's just like, oh, here, here's some money. Let me take care of you. Um, not like portraying, like not saying that he's a millionaire, but I think he eventually picks up on the fact that she thinks that. And he's like, oh, fuck, will she not like me anymore Right. if she realizes the truth? But I don't think initially he was meaning to do any of that. But it was during this time that the we find out the millionaire, when he's sober, the, yeah, cannot does, he, remember him. Does, doesn't remember him at all. Yeah, he's like, who are you? And then we start having that over and over where he gets drunk and just runs into Tramp. And he's like, hey, friend, let's go hang out. And then he's sober and runs into him and he's like, get away from me. Yeah. There, there were some, it, it was very interesting as far as that, that, uh, that dynamic with like he had to be drunk to remember the dude, mm-hmm. which I mean, okay, I guess, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean that trope. Uh, I don't know if it, I it continues trope, the it, entire movie. It goes throughout the entire movie and becomes a, a plot point later. Uh, but so at some point the flower girl gets sick, uh, and because of that she has like some fever and like she's laying there and the doctor examines her. She looks freaking dead. Um, cause she's just like dead eye staring at the camera, but because of that, she can't go out and sell flowers to, I guess, make their rent. And so the grandma was trying to do it and probably wasn't bringing in as much money because they get an eviction notice essentially saying like, if you don't get our money in so many days, well, was it, was, like it was like by the next morning. Is that what it was? Yeah. It, I couldn't it, remember need, the date. We need $22 by tomorrow morning mm-hmm. or we will take possession. Yeah. $22. And this time frame was four hundred and fifty dollars. Damn. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't cheap then. Um, yeah, I never looked at the money uh conversion on that, but yeah, it's so it's, it's not chump change. No, it's not. That's a lot of money. Um but what I thought was funny was the grandma, when the daughter comes into the room because she's like apparently feeling better now, hides the letter. She's blind, she can't read it. Why are you hiding it? <laughs> <laughs> She she may have been been able to feel the typeface or something like that in the letter. See, you could think that, but later on, Tramp comes to visit her, and while messing around in a random right, book, yeah. discovers the letter and he says, "Oh, this is for you." She's like, "Oh, read it." And so he reads it, um, and to find out that you know they're gonna lose their home, um, so that would tell me that it wasn't like hard typed into it to where she could feel what it says. Um, but then again, maybe she could, and it was just like easier to let him read it. I don't know, but that, it just that's, that's me. I was like, oh, why that's, oh, that's kind of cool. Can you read that to me? Yeah. Instead of like, why is grandma trying to hide this so mm-hmm. I can try and figure out what it says? Well, yeah, I didn't take, like, she didn't know it was hidden. I just said like, why is it hidden? But it could be that maybe she could have read it with her fingers if it's like tart typed hard enough into the letter, but it's just easier to say, hey, go ahead and read it rather than give it to me and like, yeah, you know. Um, so she starts freaking out and the tramp's like, don't worry. Like, I'll, I'll take care of it. I'll get, I'll get money for you. Millionaire's sober again and kicks him out of the house. And like, he's like, don't come near me. Who the fuck are you? Uh, so he go gets and gets a job as a street cleaner. Cleaning up, uh, animal dung from all the mm-hmm. horses. And the well, I figured saying street cleaner is better than shit scooper, but or well, pooper scooper. yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with that. <laughs> yeah. That was kind of a funny gag where. Like he was walking around with a shovel and a trash can and, you know, he's walking by a couple horses and then an elephant walks by and yeah. he's like, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was like, fuck this and turn around and went yeah. the other way. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Oh uh, yeah. But he, he still, he uses his, this, 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 um, dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Beep. He uses his lunch break to go, uh, and visit with her and everything. Um, her being the flower girl and he keeps being late back from lunch and he gets fired well right across the street from the uh, street cleaner clinic uh is apparently a boxing yeah 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 place and so some guy's like hey you need to make some money come in here let's let's do this and i guess the, the boxer is going to run a 50 50 scam with him to where like you He's know we won't really hurt each fight, other yeah. we're just kind of like pretending and you fall down and we'll split the winnings uh, and then suddenly the cops are after him. And so he has he to bolt. Yeah. And so they pull another guy off the street. that just has to be walking by the door to fight Charlie. And Charlie's like, shit. Cause the guy's like, I'm taking all the money. I'm going to beat your ass. Well, it was, it was kind of funny. They were setting that up where like this, uh, 
um, like they were showing him getting ready in the locker room or whatever. And that dude was put, you know, putting on his shoes or whatever. And this, this other boxer comes in and starts talking trash. And this, this dude that Charlie's supposed to fight just knocks him out with one punch. And mm-hmm. he's just in there like, oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's why they have like that, the, uh, the other fighter that was in there was like doing stuff with like lucky rabbit's foot and all this stuff. Yeah. And then Charlie starts rubbing that all over him too. And then that fighter gets dragged back out after his fight. They're like hanging, uh, like carrying him because he lost his fight. And then Charlie's like, shit. He's like trying to wipe off the. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so my first viewing, and I say first viewing for a reason, I'll get to it. My first viewing of the fight scene was me kind of rolling my eyes at it because essentially the referee, like Charlie's staying behind the referee to pr- keep him. Uh, and the other guy, like, separate so the guy doesn't kick his ass. And this is a whole comedic routine and dance mm-hmm. routine of what they do and everything. Um, and at first, I was kind of like, the ref's literally staying in front of him. Charlie's not running to be keep the ref between him. The ref's literally just staying in front of him. So it looks unrealistic. Um, my second viewing, I say, because I'm going to take a little tangent here. This movie made me decide to go watch Chaplin with uh, Robert Downey Jr. Mm. I literally watched it the next day. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, no. I finished this movie and watched it immediately after. Um, and a bunch of shots and footage from this movie are also in Chaplin. Oh, that's cool. Uh, and having I get to see the fight a second time, and I actually thought it was funny the second time around. So I think it was like a, I needed to step back from what the movie was and instead of like judging it and just take the movie at the movie mm-hmm. uh and it's made me go like i kind of want to go watch some other chaplain flicks just to see this you know what it was and during his heyday and everything mm-hmm. um so that's what i meant by second viewing got it Makes sense. <laughs> um so during the fight i, I noticed it's like he would jump and spear him uh, Chaplin me spearing the other guy mm-hmm. and you can see a string like yeah you, you can saw it pretty easily up. yeah and then like he's carried in there after he loses put on a table and the guy hangs his boxing gloves and you see the string slowly start lifting mm-hmm. uh, and then get pulled and the boxing glove hits him in the head and knocks him <laughs> back out again uh, so I was like that was kind of silly but I was like I can see it you know? I, I thought the whole boxing the whole boxing thing was pretty funny actually yeah. like I, I haven't seen Chaplin. You didn't need a second viewing for I, it. <laughs> I didn't no I mean I thought it was pretty funny actually like the how they kept dancing back and forth mm-hmm. and then eventually like then they started dancing back and forth and then the referee started getting into it and like I, I thought the whole sequence was pretty funny yeah like I said it, it took me a second a second time to appreciate those scenes and it's made me want to go back and like actually watch some of the other Chaplin stuff um Apparently you have to beat it into my head. <laughs> I can't just <laughs> I can't just accept it at face value. But um, not long after that, we're back at the millionaire's house, and because the millionaire's drunk again and wants to hang out with Chaplin, uh, and I'm gonna keep saying Chaplin because saying Tramp is just hard to say some, for some reason, um, and maybe because Tramp has a different connotation now. It absolutely does. <laughs> uh, but they like they come home when like somebody was trying to rob them, and I was like, oh, I see where this is gonna go. Um, and as the millionaire sobers up because he gets punched, like hit in the head with something. Well, he he'd given he'd given Charlie like a thousand dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. To, to, to take care of like he was like yeah well I'll I'll you know we'll take care of your take girl. care of the girl's rent and everything. And yeah. like here's how's a thousand dollars sound like? He, yeah, he literally said, is, is a thousand enough? And well, I was he, like, yeah, and yes. With, with, <laughs> with inflation, that was around twenty five thousand dollars. Like yeah. yes, that is good. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I forgot about that. But, I mean, he gets hit in the head, and being drunk and getting hit in the head apparently sobers you up. Mm-hmm. Because then he's Instantly. like, who are you? Where Where's my money? What's going on? Uh, and, of course, like, cops show up and find the money in Chaplin's pocket. And he's like, you gave it to me. Tell him you gave it to me. And he's like, I have never, I don't know who you are. This bothered me. And not just for the whole, like, sober, drunk, sober, drunk thing. Keep that at face value. The butler was there when he said this. The butler has met Chaplin several times and could clearly at this point, if he even had half a brain, understand that every time he's drunk, he's hanging out with this guy. And every time he's sober, he forgets who he is. He could have flat said right there, you know who this is. You hang out with him all the fucking time. Yes, but he was trying to get rid of the guy. I... But why? But Because he hated him. <laughs> why do you hate him? 
because he's 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 because he's poor. Yes. Yeah. yeah I guess and I this this that. is his one chance to get rid of him. So he's like, I mean, if they're gonna arrest him, if I don't say anything, screw that guy. I'm not saying yeah. anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, he does get arrested. Um, and I forgot to mention earlier while the chaplain was hanging out with um the flower girl, he saw like a newspaper article or whatever where like some. I don't remember what country it is, but some doctor in some other country is working like miracles. Che- it was like the touring... Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia. Was that what it was? It's like some weird Eastern European country. Yeah, he's yeah. like restoring sight. And so like the idea was like she's saving up the money, getting the money to her so she can go get her sight back. Um, so I don't know how much time passes, but he's in jail uh, for a little bit. Six months. Six months? Is that mm-hmm. what it was? Six months. I knew it wasn't a long time. Um, but by this point... He's getting out of jail. Uh, she's back from having gone on this trip and has her sight. And I had this theory pop up. Uh, and I was like, please don't tell me you're going to do this. This whole time, she's thought Chaplin has money uh, while being blind. She thought he was, like, rich. The rich guy is distraught because his woman left him. And I was like, is she going to meet him and mistake him for the tramp? And they're going to be together and live happily ever after. And Chaplin is just in his own misery. Thankfully, no, they didn't do that. Because <laughs> I was like, fucking seriously? Um, no, the millionaire, like, leaves for a, a trip or whatever. And, like, I don't think we really see him again. Yeah, he, he, yeah there was one part where he just kind of, like, like, I'm going off to Europe. And then yeah. comes back and he, they run into each other running out of a club. You know, he was drunk and he remembered him again. But after the... the um, the jail scene, they don't they don't mention him again. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it must be what I was thinking of. Uh, but yeah, with her... I, I did not realize the, the connection between eyesight and being rich. Because when she was blind, she's out on the streets selling flowers, uh, you know, from a little basket. But as soon as she can see, she has enough money to buy her own flower shop and storefront right on the main drag. <laughs> Maybe she she was doing very well for herself, or used what was left over of that money to start that business. Well, maybe that, that's how I took it. it. Was like she took. But some... I would assume that eyesight restoration surgery wasn't cheap. But I mean, we we don't know. Maybe. They didn't say. But my guess was that she used a little bit to go get the surgery, and then took the rest of it as seed money for her business. Maybe that's potential. Maybe. Uh, well, with her eyesight. You know, or when returned and she's back. She has her flower shop. The tramp's walking through town and his clothes are even rattier after being in jail for a while. Everyone's making fun of him. Kids are shooting spitballs at him and everything. And then he stumbles across the flower shop. She's laughing at him at first, but I guess feels a little sorry for him and offers him a flower. Mm-hmm. And then when he accepts it, she feels his hand, immediately grabs his hand and starts touching it. And that's when she's like, wait a minute. It, it was you. Yeah. And he's just like, and then, like, oh, you know, love has found each other. Credits. Thoughts? <laughs> I actually, I enjoyed it. Um, I, this was the first time I'd seen a Chaplin movie in its entirety. Mm-hmm. Um, I it, it kept my attention. I actually found it pretty entertaining in some parts. There was some some pretty funny gags that happened. Um, I, I really, I, you know, I enjoyed it quite a bit, actually. Sadly, on my first go through, I was like, eh, it's all right. It's not bad, whatever, but I don't really like it. But then it stuck with me just enough after credits rolled. I was like, you know, I've thought about watching Chaplin several times. Let me watch that. And so I immediately watched Chaplin. And watching Chaplin and seeing clips of this movie again that are in that Mm -hmm. made me appreciate the movie better to the point that. I actually kind of want to watch this movie again in its entirety and watch other Chaplin flicks. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is sad that I couldn't appreciate it on its own and needed the, the greatness of RDJ for me to <laughs> want to dig into it more. Right. Uh, but that's the way it worked for me. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, but no, I would agree. Like now that I watched Chaplin with it, uh, this was actually a really good movie. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, one thing that struck out at me was there was a, a movie review from the, I want to say the 40s or 50s, where they were talking about City Lights, and they mentioned that the last scene with, with him and the flower girl, when like they were kind of reconnecting with each other, 
Um, he described it as the greatest piece of acting ever committed to celluloid. Just that line stuck with me. And looking back on that movie, like, because, yeah, you know, they're, they're going to get back together and everything's going to be hunky-dory. But keep in mind that he was having to portray all of these thoughts mm. and stuff through just his face. Yeah. And that was, that was actually pretty captivating. I really enjoyed that last scene, um, just from an emotional standpoint. Um, rest of the movie had some funny gags to it, but that was actually kind of like, you know, tugging at the heartstrings a little bit. Yeah. No, apparently there's a lot of, like, people in the movie industry that, like, famous directors and movies that, like, say this is, like, their favorite flick. I know that there was a lot of trouble, I would say, going into making this movie because it took him something like two years to make, mm-hmm. even though there was only something like, what, 180 days of shooting or something like that. Uh, the actress that was the flower girl actually got fired at one point because I think she was like late. And so he fired her, brought in some other actress for a bit, and then realized it would cost way too much money for him to try to reshoot everything with this new actress. And so contacted the act, the other, what was it, Helen, whatever, or... Sorry, Virginia Cheryl. Where did I get Helen from? <laughs> um, uh, and I guess she was like, all right, I'll come back, but I want double my salary. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, fine, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, no, it, it was it was an int- it was a good movie. I, I, I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I'd be fine watching it again at some point in the future. Yeah, sorry for my daughter scream there. Yep. Um, so with that in mind, I, I already feel like I know where this is going to go. Because uh, I've been around for all three podcasts. If you haven't, go watch them. <laughs> so the winner that we both picked for the original, um, not the original, but the first podcast in this 1931 series, when it comes to the box office earnings, mm-hmm. uh, we chose um, Aerosmith as our favorite out of those two. Aerosmith versus City Lights to get your best box office one. Is that is that really a question? Yes, it is a question. City Lights, hands down. I agree. Like I said, <laughs> I already know where the answers are going. Yeah. Like, this, this is a rare time where I think we already know each other's answers, and it's potentially going to be unanimous. We're going through the motions on this but one, guys. But we, we, we're doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, Academy Award um, nominees that did not win. The one that we chose as our favorite was the front page. That was a best of... You know, whatever a situation. So Academy Awards. Out of Cimarron and the front page that we chose, do we feel the Academy Awards got it right picking Cimarron over the front page? As the best picture winner? Out of those two, yeah. I guess. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would have to feel this, uh, the same way. because I, I mean, I'm not thrilled. Yeah, but, I mean it is what it is. Yeah, no, I'm like out of Cimarron on the front page. I'm like neither of the, it's it's neither of them were great, and it's kind of like uh, yeah, I guess Cimarron for some of its progressive ideas. That is that was about why, the only so, that was yeah. about the only reason why. I mean, had those not been there, I wouldn't. I, I'd I'd be I'd be fine with writing the movie off and never watching it again. Yeah. So with one of the rare occasions thus far. Of us agreeing that out of the Academy Awards ones we watched, the winner was the best out of those. And out of the box office ones we watched, the highest earning box office was the best of those. Now it's time for the official showdown between Academy Awards and box office. Did Academy Awards get it right or did the people get it right? The people got the it people right. The people got it right. Hands down, with no question. City Lights was the best movie of everything we watched for 1931. Yeah, hands down, Easy. no question. Easy. So, there you go. I think this is this might be... I mean, I have to go back and check. I, I don't remember. But this might be the first time we've agreed on every single piece throughout you know, the process. We have, yeah. We've, I, we've agreed on a movie here and there, but not, not every not, single one. Not the one. entire line, yeah. 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 This would be the first time that we've agreed on everything. Yeah, um... And with the fact that both of us are like, I might go watch City Lights again, I think should say something to anybody who's actually potentially listening to this and hasn't watched the movies. Maybe they use this to be like, well, let me let me just listen to this first and see which ones I might want to watch. Yeah. City Lights, I think, is the first one where I'm like, go watch that. There, Out there's... of everything we've watched, nothing would I be like, yes, you should watch it. And they're just like, eh, it was all right. This one, I'm like, yeah, go watch it. There's, there's a reason why it's on... 
like you said, a lot of directors, top 10 lists on movies that you have to see. Um, Charlie Chaplin is a, a name mm -hmm. and a big one. And, and there's this, this movie is one of those reasons why. Um, I would I would recommend it to, even if you're not a big fan of silent films. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to enjoy about this particular movie, even if there isn't like audible dialogue. There's a lot of funny stuff that happens with it. There's a, a fun little message to it. Um, and like I said, that last scene was kind of tugging at the heartstrings a little mm. bit, and it, it's worthy of that that critic line that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, like I I fully intend to go and watch it a second time without the idea of like I'm I'm watching this and trying to critique it and take the pieces out of it and what's good, what's bad in order for the podcast conversation. Yeah, I want to watch it again just to be like I'm just watching this for the enjoyment of watching this and let me see what I get from it. Yeah. I, I, so. I, I, I'd say that's a good, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, and this one, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, actually is actually part of the Criterion collection. It absolutely too. is. So yeah. I watched it on, um, it was on prime, I believe, or no, it was on HBO max. Hmm. Um, I got this one for the DVD from the library as well. Well, the, the Criterion, <laughs> like this, the Criterion collection looked and sounded fantastic. They yeah. spend an incredible amount of money restoring these old movies to add them to that collection so it yeah. looked and sounded great no oh. well the dvds uh, looked and sounded great too so yeah. i i totally agree um with that in mind uh i forgot to pull up the 1932 movies that we're doing next well <laughs> guess they'll have to find out later oh goodness uh we'll pull it grab your phone uh, you can look it up real quick where is my phone i don't know because we're not using your phone for anything they're, okay. they're highlighted green. So we were looking at... So homework for 1932, because this is the end of the 1931 uh, podcast series. We're going into the 1932, and we will be starting with the box office. So what is the highest box office for that year? That was a movie called The Sign of the Cross. Sign of the Cross. All right. And, and what are the other two we need? Uh, so the, the other two we're two, actually watching for the next episode. There was a farewell to arms. Farewell to arms. And the big broadcast. The big broadcast. Um, so we're doing a farewell to arms and the big broadcast for the next episode. Yes. So that is your assignment. That's your homework. Get it done on time. <laughs> but until then, I'm Jeffrey. I'm Anthony. See you at the movies. <laughs>